Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Sean Moat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. Super interesting to hear about that sort of stuff regarding the delivery and the challenges that people face. Um, particularly in data science world, one of the biggest challenges that I tend to see um, is the inability for us to actually apply and utilize the data science algorithms or machine learning, whatever you want to call it, in real world applications. And so one of the reasons I chose this title, and I, was going to, I just wanted to raise that, is because the most important word in my title is applied. And it's something I made very, very, very clear to the business I've worked for now, a company called The Zone. Uh, that is the most important aspect. We can do as much machine learning as we want to, but we need to actually do it. But I'm not here to talk about it today. I'm here to talk about the zone itself and our... The clicker's not working. Sorry, guys. <laughs> there we go. Cool. Um, let's talk about the zone. So who is the zone? I don't, I'm not sure if anybody's actually heard of the zone. Can I get any hands up who's actually heard of them? So quite a few, actually. Not too bad. There's a couple of design people, I think, over there, I can see. Um, so <laughs> effectively, we are a company who uh, were initiated probably two or three years ago. And we started as a, we're a startup. And we're a, pretty much a, a we're, way we're described as a Netflix of live sports. We run app, an OTT application where you can stream any sport you want for £10 a month in general, um, where in Germany, for instance, we'll have the Premier League, the Champions League, um, Bundesliga, Serie A, Liga, Lots of different soccer, lots of tennis, NFL, NHL. It's a very big platform. And effectively, we, oh, wrong way. we uh, like I said, started in 2016. In 2016, we launched in Germany and Japan, um, or Austria and Switzerland as well. We call that DAC in, in, in our internal systems. But that is where we started. We had about 35 to 80 people in the company at that time. Um, I joined at this period, around this period. Uh, we had 85 people in, in central London. And then we decided to expand. And now we're in multiple, country, multiple more countries. Canada, United States, Italy, Spain, Brazil, which has just launched recently. And with that has come a tremendous amount of growth um, in the company. And we, we find ourselves in, a, in a pretty much a much more complex world. Where we have many different fields that we worry about. Sports OTT, obviously the main, the main bread and butter of what we do is how we can get customers to live stream their content on the application and uh, within the web platform. We also, though, have a company called, or a subset called Design Media. We have editorial websites, spox.com, goal.com, sporting news, lots of, different, um, lots of different areas. We also have original content team who build up, um, we just recently partnered with Lebr LeBron James to create documentary series. We have boxing content that gets generated, lots of different things. Global partnerships, rights acquisition operations. So as we've grown, we've gone from a very, very small team of 85 people, and we've now expanded to what is said to be, and this is not yet, I'm not yet, God, this is just the analyst. Our current quote is we went from 85 people in 2016 to 2,500 people. And what I, wanted, what I wanted to talk to you today about is essentially what challenges we faced in doing that. The tremendous growth we've had in two years has created such a, a complex beast of how do you actually apply and utilize data science within that world. And so, as you can see here, in 2016 when I joined, or well, around 2016, we've had quite a few different events, but the analyst community within the zone has been pretty much growing steadily, very quickly, over, many, over the last two years. And this is no end in sight at this point. And so, with that high pace, um, we find ourselves asking the questions around what we actually need to be worrying about. Um, one other part is it's across different time zones. And we really want to focus in on the key challenges. When you go from that size team, we've got four people. You, go, you can literally see each other's whites in the eye situation. You can actually talk to people every single day. And then you go to 68 across different teams in different applications, in different areas of the business, and try to work with, work with, the, with them all to bring them together to actually do something and deliver and apply what they need to be, uh, apply their, their, their learnings. We effectively have four key principles that we follow. Um, and they're quite, not, they're quite normal. There's nothing, nothing crazy here. It's probably nothing no one's ever seen before, but it's super important how we've done this. And effectively, what we have here is, um, I'm just going to go through each of, the, each of the key challenges and talk you through that. So keeping it simple. This is something that's very much of value in many big businesses, keeping it simple, but we seriously do try to keep it as simple as possible. Within our world, we find ourselves in a, in a marketplace where in data science, many people love to do the technical stuff. They love to play with, with code. They love to 
to try different things, like to work with AWS, and they like to use different infrastructures. But what we actually want to do is to make sure that when we're actually applying and utilizing our, 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 our tooling, that we keep it as simple as possible. And the main reason we do that is because we want to ensure that when new people join, they can understand it quickly. We can't have people, um, again, a quote that I used a second ago, but when we're in Amsterdam, we have six, six new starters every single week. We can't have people coming in every week and trying to understand a complex beast. So we need to make sure that everything is simplified to a very, very <laughs> significant degree. We also then have to manage the growth, right? We can't, we can't simply let it happen. We can't, let, we can't have, the, have the world where we just start hiring people, which is something that many people can get into the habit of, is hiring without worrying about how they're actually going to be onboarded, make sure that they're, they're understanding of what, what's needed to be done, and actually move, move them into the team and make them feel a part of it. We want to make sure we're centralizing the truth as much as we can, and we do this in a key way I'll show in a second, but this is very normal. Um, we, I think uh, Damien spoke earlier today about the single source of truth. I think the most common term I've ever heard in all the business I've worked for so far is the single customer view, which I've never actually seen. I've never seen a single customer view. But what we can do is we can provide and centralize the truth of how to get to some variant of that single customer, truth, of that single customer view. If you want to start the stitching data sets together, what is the actual logic to do so? And we centralize that logic. We don't necessarily have to centralize the data. And then finally is documentation. And this is the bane of everybody uh, that's worked in many different data science platforms. You build an algorithm, and you're asked to then document the whole thing. And you find yourself going over the work twice, if not three times, after amends and different changes. This is a very challenging thing. When we are a very high-paced company, where we're growing, like I said, from 85 to 2,500 customer employees, and we have many, many analysts coming into the market, we don't want to spend too much time documenting but we do need documentation. And so what I want to go through is essentially how we've done it um, and how we've sort of managed that, that sort of growth and, and how we've sort of implemented a, um, a solution for this. Now, I've, I've done it in such a way that it's a little bit of data IQ centric, so please bear with me, but it, there is expanded upon around this. So keeping it simple. Now, as funny as this is, I get this often. I think I, I deal with this conversation every single day from any of my employees. Why can't I code? Why can, I, why can I do Python scripting? Why can I do a SQL scripting? We personally have a mantra in, in, in my team, uh, internally, is you can, go for it. However, if this is going to be a production level code and we're gonna implement it and apply into a sol central loop solution, it needs to be utilized vi visual re recipes and the actual Im embedded code within the visual recipes needs to be used. And there's two reasons for that. One is it essentially creates a logical framework for how you've actually come to the solution, which is very visual and you can see what's going on. Instead of just seeing SQL and having to read through SQL scripts or comments, authorship, row counts, you can just read it logically. And the, last, the, other part, the other reason for it is talent-wise, we can't always guarantee the best talent is coming in all the time. So why not simplify the workflows in order to allow people who aren't as talented as some other data scientists, who don't have PhDs, to come in and read it? Why not have a commercial, um, a commercial analyst who's worked in finance and accounting for many years come and read the flow? and actually identify where the issues are. Logically, see where the issues are. There's no need to worry about the code. People get quite, um, it's, and that's why, so we focus on that very heavily, even through the recruitment. We didn't necessarily always want to hire data scientists. We wanted different perspectives, and this allowed us to do that, because we can go away and find people who had a, had a different view on design, had a different way of analyzing numbers, and, and collaborate with our most talented data scientists, right? This is a super important element. When we're managing growth, there's a lot of people coming in and piling into the work. We tend to try to keep our, all our work, workflows quite open source in a way, and I'm, I put that in a quotation marks, it depends on who collaborates. But effectively, this is one of our, um, one of our key workflows uh, that actually manages how we identify customers, a bit of the logic that we have. And we essentially utilize these, these types of frameworks to manage who is contributing. We've had upwards of 30 people contribute. I don't, obviously, M at the very end there probably hasn't contributed much. S has contributed a lot, uh, and the picture there is going to be the second most. Um, but effectively, we can manage this, and we can see who's doing what. We can make sure we can check how they, what changes they're making. We can verify what they're doing is correct, and we're able to manage getting new people in and not having to worry about going, look, guys, be careful about what you're doing. Jump in, make your changes. We'll see the contributions, and we'll be able to document and see what you're doing in the background. So it's a very important tool for us to understand who's on the platform, who's using it, who's onboarding with it, and who's applying the, 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 the uh, actual, the actual um, who's applying any new logic to the, to the framework. Centralizing truth, um, a key one. Again, single customer view. 
right? There is an element of, we're, we're obviously very lucky in some ways that we're, we're a startup and we built our data warehouse very early on. We're not a, per, not a team that's had to deal with mergers and acquisitions with different databases and the difficulty that surrounds that to try and bring things together. Um, and obviously with key <laughs> IDs and customer identification. But however, we still have the logic that needs to be applied on top of it. So what we do is globally, we, allow to, uh, we utilize global shared code where we have Python libraries that we've built internally that allow analysts in, in, in Tokyo or in New York or in Milan or Sao Paulo to literally apply those, these, these functions with certain parameters and they can get the data sets they need back. Now that means they don't have to go and do it themselves. And if they do want to do it themselves, they can at least see the logic. They can come in here and read the, read the Python script. They can understand how it's actually written out and they can actually share it. And if they want to contribute and improve on it, they can. They're more than welcome to. And essentially we allow uh, the global team, which is now, like I said, 55, 60 strong, including teams in different marketing, in different functions, to, to actually utilize these, 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 these tools. Um, this was built um, probably in the first two months of us, uh, uh, of us starting, so 2016, October, and it's still being used as a core library. I don't know why they called it MFL, but they did. Anyway, so that's what we do. And when we come down to documentation, now, like I said before, we, we, we really focus on when we, we take a flow or we take um, any sort of work that we're going to utilize, such as this one here, which is um, our ability to identify our customers and count how many subscribers we have, all the different movements, it's our trading numbers, right? This has a tremendous amount of logic that's embedded within it, right? We have, the, we have general changes, and this happens in every single business. Imagining a world where, um, where we make a partnership deal with a certain, certain partner in Japan, um, Docomo is the one I'm thinking of, uh, and that logic has not been applied in the systems, in the product, which means who has to fix it in the data? We do. So what we do is we use, um, like I said, visual recipes as where we can when we're going to be sharing this code and we're going to be utilizing and, and productionizing it. But we also get to comment on it. And the reason I, I, I share this is because there's no need, there's a much more limited need for us to write confluence pages about why we did things, what the SQL is, what the comments are. It's all here. Essentially, anybody in the business who has the mind to read the, the discussion points and just general documentations in each of those nodes are more than welcome to. With this, I'm actually able to, to share this with people in strategy and say this is how we apply free trials to Docomo customers. You can just see it. And we found that it's actually been quite, uh, quite useful to be able to go, to be able to in introduce this type of logic and this type of framework to non-coders and non-data scientists, which has created a huge benefit for, the, benefit for this business. Now, I realize I think I, I started a little bit back because I didn't see the time to start, so I think I'm pretty, pretty close uh, to getting done. But, just to put, point out that this is just one element of the tooling that we have. We have this for every tool that we use. Now, DataIQ is fantastic. That we've, we've found it's been a really great tool that we've grown with over the last two years. We've utilized across the board. Um, but obviously, we need extra help in certain areas. So when we talk about machine learning algorithms that actually impact the product, we sometimes look for different tooling. But the principles are always the same. We look for tooling that allows us to limit documentation. In fact, I think I've got it here. To keep it simple, as in we have coding, uh, we use Terraform to spin up um, AWS cloud infrastructure for any of our work. So if we need to spin up a, a GPU to run a recommendation algorithm, then we use Terraform to actually manage that infrastructure, which Terraform itself is, quick, is just without being too, I'll get a little bit technical, hopefully everybody understands, is a YAML-based um, uh, system, which is very easy to read. It literally goes one by one, do this, do this, do this. It's very easy and very um, pseudo-code-esque. It allows people to just read how it actually works in, in, in order of operation. We use also drone to do unit testing, which, allow, which is all documented on, internally and managed by a central system, which allows us to move quickly. For the other part is on, <laughs> on centralizing truth and do documentation, we always look for tools that allow us to limit the amount of work we have to do to share our knowledge with our, comp our, our other contributors around the globe. Um, what that's enabled us to do is to focus on delivery. It's, it's been nothing but delivery. We try to make sure that every single day, a data scientist doesn't have to worry about coding, doesn't have to worry about sitting in meetings, as pe people on the panel discussed, and understanding what the business requirements are. What they focus on is delivery and applying that logic to a system. And this, and like I said, DataRecu has been one of those tools that allowed us to do this. Now, I'm about to, 
leave the stage in a second. However, I've got a, um, a minute or two uh, video, if any, uh, so please uh, do, do, do comment. Hopefully it's not too loud. The last time I did this, it blasted the room. So um, let's see how that goes. Um, but effectively, this uh, is a bit about the zone. Um, hopefully give you guys a bit more of a sense of who we are um, and allows you to sort of understand what arena of what data you can imagine that we look at and how we actually utilize our data um, to, to improve our application. So like I said, I'll leave you guys there and I'll click this button. Hopefully it works and it's not too loud. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Something that I'm proud of Out of the box and epoxy To the world and the vision we've lost I'll do what it takes Whatever it takes Do what it takes.